السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم اخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم واكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفه العلم وحسن اخلاقنا بالحلم واجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون احسنه ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. إن شاء الله we're going to continue with uh, حديث number six today in the 40 hadith collection of Imam Nawawi رحمه الله تعالى. Uh, for those of you who have missed uh, the previous sessions, if you would like to watch the recordings, they are all available on the ICC Plano Masjid's YouTube channel. Uh, if you just go to the channel and do a search for um, Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith. Uh, you'll find the playlist, uh, inshallah. So today is part 10 in the series, and we're going to go over hadith number 6, inshallah. So Imam al-Nawawi says, rahimahullah ta'ala, al-hadith al-sabis, an Abi Abdullah ibn Nu'man ibn Bashirin radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma qal, sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, inna al-halala bayin, wa inna al-harama bayin, wa baynahuma mushtabihat, لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس فمن اتقى الشبهات فقد استبرأ لدينه وعرضه ومن وقع في الشبهات وقع في الحرام فالراعي يرعى حول الحما يوشك أن يرتع فيه ألا وإن لكل ملك حما ألا وإن حما الله محارمه ألا وإن في الجسد مضغة إذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله وإذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله ألا وهي القلب <coughs> رواه البخاري ومسلم So this hadith is hadith number 6 in this collection of 40 hadith on the authority of Abu Abdullah and Nu'man ibn Bashir may Allah be pleased with him and his father So the narrator is Nu'man ibn Bashir who is a uh, who was a young companion at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He was born about 14 months after the migration to Medina so he was you know, about um, um, about nine years old when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. Uh, and his father, Bashir, was also a Sahabi. So Nu'man is saying, Samir Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Yaqul, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying. Uh, so this is a, a teaching that he heard directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He didn't hear it from an older companion who heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu He this one, he says, Samir to I heard myself, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying. And this is interesting because um, a nine-year-old boy, or maybe he was much younger than that, who knows, you know, when he heard these words from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was nine when he passed away. So he could have been eight or seven or, or nine or, or uh, you know, he was young, he was very young. And uh, for him to, to, to have heard this from the Prophet Sallallahu shows that he was around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even though the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a 60 year old man, a youth of age nine, eight uh, would be, would be following him around, would be uh, listening to him, would be uh, listening to his talks or, you know, maybe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be giving him personal advice and giving him attention. So uh, show, it shows, you know, the, uh, the character of the Sahaba, the young Sahaba at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It also shows uh, the care and the attention that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to give to the young companions. So it says, in al-halal abayyin wa in al-haram abayyin. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, indeed, the halal is plain and clear, and the haram is plain and clear. وَبَيْنَهُمَا مُشْتَبِهَاتٍ and between the two of them are doubtful matters. Many people, 
from mankind do not know them. In other words, uh, they're doubtful matters that are not known to many people. Many people don't know whether these things are halal or haram because they're doubtful to most people. So whoever avoids the doubtful matters, he protects his faith and his honor. But the one who falls into the doubtful matters falls into the haram. Just like a shepherd who is grazing his sheep around the um, sanctuary of a king. Right, so there's like imagine there's a palace. The palace has a has a sanctuary, a boundary, and the shepherd is raising his sheep too close to the boundaries of the palace. He is uh, uh, he is he is uh, vulnerable to accidentally have his sheep graze in the sanctuary. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, every king has a sanctuary, and the sanctuary of God or Allah are the things that he has made unlawful, things that he has made haram. Then he said, Indeed, in the body there is a mudra. Mudra is a, uh, a piece of flesh that uh, looks like it's been chewed on, you know, um, or uh, something that is small enough that you can chew it in your mouth. So there's this small piece of flesh in the body. If it is rectified, then the rest of the body will be rectified. But if it is corrupted, then the rest of the body will be corrupted. That piece of flesh is the qalb, the heart. And this hadith was related by Bukhari and Muslim in their sound collections of hadith. <clears throat> Let's go over this hadith, inshallah, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll finish this hadith today. And then uh, if we have time, we can start the next hadith or we can start the next hadith tomorrow, inshallah. <clears throat> um, so this is another one of very important hadiths, a very important teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we've seen so far, every single hadith in this collection has been a very foundational and important uh, tradition of the Prophet alayhi uh, salatu When it comes to this hadith, um, you know, Muslim scholars unanimously agree that it's a hadith with great benefits. It's one of those ahadith that lie at the center of, of Islam. Um, <clears throat> some of the ulama said it constitutes one third of Islam. Some said it constitutes one fourth of Islam. Others said it constitutes one fifth of Islam. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a foundational teaching of the Prophet. ﷺ. And this hadith forms the basis for a principle in Islamic law, which is known as Saddu Dhari'a. Saddu Dhari'a is a principle that means blocking the means to something. Blocking the means to something. If, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made something haram, Anything that leads to it also becomes haram. Anything that will most likely lead to haram also becomes haram on the basis of this hadith and also on the basis of other texts in the Quran such as wala taqrabu zina or tilka hududullahi fala taqrabuha. You know, these are the uh, limits of Allah. So don't go near them. Uh, don't go near fornication. Uh, so uh, blocking the means is, is a principle in Islamic law and uh, there are things that are deemed haram in our deen not because they're haram in and of themselves but because they lead to haram right so so for example um, uh, while somebody's fasting for them to kiss their spouse while they're fasting it's considered either makru or haram and the reason for that is because it can potentially lead to something that is clearly haram, which is for them to engage in uh, sexual intercourse. So uh, this hadith forms the basis for this important principle in Islamic law. So uh, the first part of the hadith says, إِنَّ الْحَلَالَ بَيِّنْ وَالْحَرَامَ بَيِّنْ وَبَيْنَهُمَا 
أمور وبينهما مشتبهات إن الحلال بين وإن الحرام بين وبينهما مشتبهات The halal is clear and the haram is clear So halal is clear Things like bread, fruit, oil, honey, talking, walking, etc. These are clearly halal things And then there are things that are clearly haram like wine, like pork, or uh, meat of an animal that was not slaughtered properly. Um, fornication, lying, backbiting, and so on. Things that are clearly haram. But between the two are doubtful matters, gray areas. Okay, so what is meant by doubtful matters? There are different kinds of doubtful matters. Um, one kind of doubtful matter is uh, things that are a mixture of halal and haram. Things that are a mixture of halal and haram. So for example, let's say that uh, somebody has a um, <clears throat> um, somebody has a business, you know, where they where they are selling things that are halal but then as they're doing these various transactions one transaction they cheat somebody they cheat somebody and they take their money and they put it in that same cash register now this particular transaction was haram because they cheated somebody they deceived somebody right but that money went into the same pile that the other money was in which was halal so now this pile of money has become mixed. It's a mixture of halal and haram. Okay. Um, or let's say that um, uh, somebody has a sack of dates. Somebody has a sack of dates. And then they steal somebody's dates and put them in the sack. Now this sack of dates becomes mixed. Some of them are halal while others are haram. It's a mixture, okay? So a mixture of halal and haram uh, is one example of doubtful. So when you take out one date from that sack, or you take out one dollar from that cash register, is it halal or is it haram? It's doubtful. It could be either one because that pile contains a mixture of halal and haram wealth, okay? <clears throat> um. Somebody has a business where they sell items that are halal, like milk, like produce, but they also sell items that are haram, like alcohol, for example, okay? The money that they're earning from the sale of these items is a mix of halal and haram. So the wealth as a whole becomes doubtful. Now, a lot of people ask a question in this regard, and that is, is it permissible for me to deal with somebody whose wealth is a mix of halal and haram? Let's say that somebody gives me a gift. Somebody gives me a gift. And I know that the wealth of this person is a mix of halal and haram because this person has earnings that are halal and this person also has earnings that are haram. Can I accept that gift? Okay, here the ulama say that if the majority of the person's wealth is halal, okay, but there are some elements of their wealth that are haram, then it is permissible for me to have a commercial transaction with that person. Okay, um, so for example, um, buying, selling, accepting gifts from that person and so on, okay? It is halal for me to do that. All the Muslim scholars agree. As long as the majority of the wealth of this person comes from a halal source and a minority is from the haram source. But what if the majority of the wealth is coming from haram income and there is some halal in there, right? So somebody has a business where the majority of the sales that they do are haram, 
unlawful. But there is some halal uh, transactions. There are some halal transactions taking place as well. Can I deal with such a person? Can I accept a gift from such a person, for example? Here, the majority, there's a, there's a difference of opinion in this issue. The view of Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, is that it is unlawful to deal with someone, the majority of whose wealth is haram. It's, it's haram to deal with such a person, to, to take the money of such a person, to accept a gift from such a person. This is the view of Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala. However, his view represents the, major, the minority opinion. The majority view, which is the view of Imam Nawawi, as well as Ibn Hajar al-Haytami and many others, is that it is permissible to deal with such a person uh, in financially. It is permissible, even though the majority of their wealth is from a haram source, it is still permissible to, to deal with this person financially, but it is better not to. It is better not to, out of precaution. And part of the reasoning is this hadith, because the hadith is saying what? When it comes to doubtful matters, when it comes to gray areas, it is better to avoid it, okay? So the view of the majority of the scholars is it's better to avoid it, but is it halal? Yes, it is halal for me to accept gifts from such a person and so on. So that's one type of doubtful uh, matters. Doubtful matters includes uh, mixed uh, property or mixed wealth that is mixed between halal and haram. Another example of doubtful matters is those matters whose permissibility is debated between the ulama or between the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa disagreed about the permissibility of a particular matter, or the scholars of Islam have disagreed over the permissibility of a particular matter, then that thing becomes doubtful. That thing becomes doubtful. So uh, that's another example of, of doubtful matters. Another example of doubtful matters is uh, new issues that are still under research. So the ulama are still doing research on them and they haven't come out with a clear verdict about it, okay? So uh, if, there's a, if there's a new kind of uh, commercial transaction, let's say, a new type of currency, let's say, that just you know, came out and people are wondering, well, is it halal or is it haram? And the ulama still don't have an answer because they are still debating. So while that debate is going on, while the, the analysis and the research is still going on, that matter is clearly gray. It's a gray area, it's a doubtful matter, okay? <clears throat> so what is the hadith saying about doubtful matter? It's saying that whoever avoids it, you know, uh, protects his faith and his honor. So when it comes to doubtful matters, um, especially when somebody feels uh, a hesitation in their heart, then this hadith applies. If they feel, if they don't feel right about doing something, even though some of the ulama have allowed it, but others have not, and you don't feel right about doing something, then that is a doubtful matter to you. All right. Now, why are the why do ulama differ about things? Why are there differences in opinion among the ulama? That's a topic that is a big topic, so I don't want to get into that right now. Let's just move on to the next part of the hadith that says, "La yalamuhunna kathirun min nas The Prophet ﷺ said, "They are not known to many people." Now, this phrase is interesting, right? Because when he said they're not known to many people, which implies what? That they are known to some people. They're known. They are known to some people. So uh, that means that there are some people to whom they're not doubtful. Okay. So, for example, an alim, a scholar who does his thorough research about a particular matter and concludes that this is halal. Well, this is not doubtful for him anymore that this is halal. Okay. It may be doubtful to you because there are other opinions of the ulama that are you know, confusing you. 
whether this is halal or haram. So for you, because it's a doubtful matter, it's better for you to avoid it. But for this alim, it's not a doubtful matter. It is clearly halal for him. So there's nothing wrong with the alim to uh, indulge in it. Okay. So sometimes you might see a scholar eating something and you're like, I can't believe this person eats that. So many of the ulama have said that this is not allowed. It's not allowed to eat this kind of food. Well, what you don't understand, or what you're forgetting, is that this is a scholar. And to this scholar, this is clearly halal. This is not a doubtful matter for him. Because as the Prophet said, many people don't know about them. Some people do. Okay. So that's one thing. The other thing is that these doubtful matters, many of them can be known. You know, they are doubtful, they are, they are gray, but with proper ijtihad, uh, by applying the rules of usul al-fiqh, it is possible to arrive at a clear answer in many cases. Not in all cases, but in many cases, okay? So, لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس. And then uh, he says, فمن اتقى الشبهات فقد استبرع لدينه وعيضه. That whoever avoids the doubtful matters, <coughs> whoever avoids the doubtful matters, uh, protects his or her faith and his or her honor. Okay. So now, what does this mean? I think we all understand what it means to protect one's faith, right? Because obviously, if I avoid the doubtful matters, then I will protect my faith. That's I think clear. But what? Why did he say protects his honor? Protects his honor. Well, that's because the person who um, indulges too much in doubtful matters, people, when they see you uh, engaging in things that are doubtful, they're going to have a negative opinion of you. They're going to have a negative opinion of you because doubtful matters, you know, they seem like they might be haram. And for you to partake in them or, or indulge in them, uh, you know, that can develop a negative perception about you uh, in the hearts of people, in the minds of people. And, um, and so what this teaches us is something very interesting, it teaches us that when it comes to what other people think about us, um, we should care. We should care about what other people think about us, especially the righteous. How do the righteous people perceive me? How do uh, Muslims, uh, believers, you know, worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what opinion do they have of me? What is their perception about me? This is something that should be important to me. Okay? No, not any people. I shouldn't care about what anybody, just anybody thinks about me, but people who are righteous, who are God-fearing, who are learned. Okay? Uh, part of the reason is because uh, the Prophet ﷺ shows us that. The Prophet ﷺ, one day, he was uh, in i'tikaf and uh, his wife, Safiya anha, came to visit him at nighttime, during the night, in the middle of the night, she came to visit him. She needed to talk to him about something. So he sat down with her and they talked for a while. And then when she was done, she got up to leave, and the Prophet ﷺ walked her to the door of the masjid. Now, he can't go outside of the door because he's in the itikaf. So he walked her to the door of the masjid. There's nobody in the masjid, right? Walks to the door of the masjid and stands there so that he can watch her go back to her home. It's night, it's dark, and she's dressed, you know, from head to toe, covered from head to toe as the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to do because it was required for them to do that. So she's dressed in black from head to toe and she walks away. As soon as she walks away, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa notices that there's a group of companions that are walking by in the distance. They're walking by and they seem to start walking quickly. As soon as they see the Prophet ﷺ with his wife, they start walking quickly. Now, the companions, they noticed that the Prophet ﷺ was with 
Sophia radiallahu ta'ala anha. So they wanted to give him his privacy. So that's why they were walking away quickly. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, slow down, slow down. This is my wife, Safiya. So now the companion said to him, Ya Rasulullah, subhanAllah, why are you clarifying this to us? Obviously, we weren't going to think badly of you. you know. But the Prophet وسلم, he knew that it's dark and they can't see who this is. And a thought can come to their mind that who is the Prophet with at this time of the night? There's a woman leaving you know, from the masjid, uh, a thought could come to their mind. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted to make sure that such a thought didn't come to their mind. Why did he care? Why did he care what the companions thought about this? This shows us that it is important that we care about what righteous people think about us. So whoever avoids the doubtful matters protects his honor. Okay, he maintains a good reputation in the minds and in the hearts of righteous people around him. After we die, we want people to say good things about us. Because when people say good things about a person after they pass away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives that person. And that person has a bigger likelihood of going to Jannah. Because those people who are praising the person after he dies or she dies, they are in a way uh, doing, uh, they're, they're vouching for him. They're testifying, uh, you know, for his goodness and for his virtue. So the hadith, uh, again, it says, uh, that whoever avoids the doubtful matters, he or she uh, protects uh, their deen and their honor. And whoever falls into the doubtful matters falls into the haram, falls into the unlawful. Now, what does this mean that whoever falls into the doubtful matters falls into the unlawful? I mean, doubtful matters are not unlawful. So why does it say that whoever falls into the doubtful falls into the unlawful? Now, here, uh, first of all, you know, I, I should clarify that when it comes to doubtful matters, the question is, it's, it's clearly not haram, it's clearly not halal. But the question is, is it halal or is it haram? A doubtful matter. Is it halal or is it haram? It's not clearly halal, it's not clearly haram. But the scholars of Islam have to have a legal ruling for everything. So everything has to be either halal or haram. There is no middle ground here. So when it comes to doubtful matters, the ulama agree that it is halal. Doubtful matters are halal. They agree about that. Yes, it is better to avoid them. It's better to avoid them, but they are not haram. So if somebody, for example, if there's a difference of opinion among the scholars about the impermissibility of something, it is halal for the person to consume it or to indulge in it. It's better to avoid because it's a doubtful matter. But is it haram? No, it is not haram. Why? Because al aslu fil ashiai al ibaha. Because there is a principle in our deen that says the default ruling for all things is that they are halal until they are proven to be haram. And since this thing is not proven to be haram, it's still in the gray area. It retains the default ruling, which is that it is halal. Okay, so. Things are not haram until they are proven to be haram. Until and unless they're proven to be haram, they remain halal. They might be clearly halal or in the gray zone, but they are not haram until they're proven to be haram. So somebody who engages in a doubtful matter, we cannot say that you, know, you are doing something haram. They're not doing something haram. They're doing something halal. But now, is it better for them to avoid it? Yes, it is better for them to avoid it. Somebody, why is it better for them to avoid it? Well, the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever falls into the doubtful falls into the haram. This doesn't mean that the doubtful matters are haram. What this means is two things. It means two things. Number one, the one who frequently indulges in doubtful matters will slip into the haram by mistake. 
the one who frequently, who makes it a habit to indulge in doubtful matters will eventually by mistake slip into the haram. That's one reason why we should avoid indulging in doubtful matters, okay? The other reason is because <clears throat> when somebody engages in doubtful matters, they gradually drift from what is less doubtful to what is more doubtful to what is even more doubtful until one is ready to deliberately commit what is haram, okay? So it, it's, it's a gradual process that makes one less and less sensitive to haram, makes them desensitized to haram until there comes a point where they are ready to commit what is clearly haram, okay? So uh, this is another reason why the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever falls into the doubtful will eventually, in other words, will eventually fall into haram. And then the Prophet ﷺ uh, made an analogy with, uh, with a shepherd who's grazing his sheep around the sanctuary of a king. You know, uh, it's very vulnerable for him to accidentally graze his sheep inside the boundaries of the palace or inside the uh, the sanctity or the sanctuary of, of, the, of the king and uh, the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the things that he made haram, okay? Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about the heart. Before we talk about the heart, let me just uh, say a few other things about this. Um, Sometimes people ask this question, you know, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not clarify everything? And why are there doubtful matters to begin with? Why is it that scholars, for example, disagree about certain matters? Why is it that scholars can't agree? Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make everything crystal clear in the Quran? And why didn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do so in the sunnah? And there are many answers to this, okay? There are many answers to this. One answer is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, wanted to encourage ijtihad. He wanted to encourage the scholars to do ijtihad. He wanted to distinguish the best scholars from the average scholars, okay? So there are many answers, but the, really the, the most important answer to this question is he did, the to, he did it to facilitate things for us. He did it to facilitate things for us. Because when, when the ulama disagree with one another, that is actually an expression of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is an expression of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if all the scholars agreed, then we wouldn't have a second opinion. And if we didn't have a second opinion, we wouldn't have any options in our deen. Okay? But when the ulama disagree, then it creates some room. And when there's some room, then Islam becomes more adaptable to different times and different places. If Islam was very rigid, how could it be for all times and all places? It needs to have some adaptability, some room, some flexibility, and that is partially created by the presence of these ambiguous texts that could be interpreted this way or could be interpreted that way. And so when the time is right, perhaps one interpretation is better, and when the time is different, perhaps another interpretation is better. And there are ulama that interpret it this way or that way. So uh, this type of difference in opinion, that is a legitimate difference of opinion among the ulama, is actually an expression of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our deen um, uh, practical for all times and all places. And also so that we have some options when the view of a particular alim is very difficult for me to follow. It, it presents an unnecessary, undue hardship on me. But alhamdulillah, there are other opinions that are available that are permissible for me to follow. Now, this hadith that um, encourages us to stay away from doubtful matters, right? And it is an encouragement from the Prophet ﷺ. It is not a command. He's not ordering us to stay away from the doubtful matters. Otherwise, we would say that the doubtful matters are haram. Okay, but I just told you that doubtful matters are not haram. Therefore, it's an encouragement from him to stay away from the doubtful matters. 
So this encouragement to stay away from doubtful matters, there is a term for it that is called wara. Wara. Wara is the is the understanding that um, we should exercise precaution when it comes to matters of our deen, our religion. When somebody is is being precautious, uh, exercising caution, you know, uh, whenever there's something doubtful, they avoid it because it's doubtful. They are exercising what's called wara. Wara. Sometimes it's translated as uh, scrupulousness scrupulousness or sometimes it's translated as precaution or caution and uh, the way of wara is the way of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for sure the way of wara is the wara is the is the way of the companions many companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam many of our scholars excelled in wara okay <clears throat> they were cautious they lived a life of precaution so for example the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam, one day he was walking on the road and he found a date on the ground. He found a date on the ground. <clears throat> and he looked at that date and he made a remark. Now that date <clears throat> is in public property. There are, you know, um, a date palm trees that are uh, in the public area and, and any dates that fall from these trees, they are they may be consumed by anybody. They are halal for anybody to eat. And this is on the street. This is on the public road. But the Prophet ﷺ made a remark and he said, If I weren't, if I weren't concerned that this date might be from sadaqa, from charity, I would have eaten it. I would have eaten it if I wasn't concerned that this might be a piece of charity. Now, what is he talking about? Prophets, the Prophet ﷺ particularly was not allowed to consume sadaqa. Sadaqa was made haram for the Prophet ﷺ. He did not accept sadaqa, he did not uh, accept charity. So this date that is on the ground, is it possible that it might be sadaqa date? Well, the answer is yes. Maybe somebody was carrying a plate of dates that they wanted to give in charity and a date fell from that plate and now it's on the street. Okay, so there, that possibility is there. Is it possible that it just fell from a tree and it's completely halal? Yes, that's also possible. But because of the other possibility is there, even though it is, maybe there's a small likelihood but because of that possibility, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa avoids it. Okay. Is it halal for him to eat it? Yes, it's halal, but it's a gray area. It could be from the haram pool. And so he avoids it. This is wara. This is precaution. And this is the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the companions as well. So one time Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he had a, a servant who... Uh, <clears throat> who gave him some food to eat, right? And uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he, he ate the food. Now, after he had eaten the food, uh, the, um, the, the servant says to him, do you know what this is? And Abu Bakr says, what is it? And the servant says, well, you know, I had actually, uh, before I, I entered Islam, when I used to be a non-Muslim, I had uh, uh, some wealth that I had earned through a, haram transaction and uh, that wealth i had forgotten about it and i i just discovered it today so i used it to to buy this meal and uh, i i had served it to you and uh, abu bakr siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as soon as he heard that he puts his finger in his throat and vomits out the food throws up the food now was it necessary for him to do that absolutely not First of all, he didn't know that that was the origin of the food when he ate it. So it was halal for him. And this man, he, that was a transaction he did in Jahiliyyah. That was old time, right? But because the origin of the wealth is coming from a haram transaction, Abu Bakr does not want that to remain in his stomach. So he spits it out. So this is also a 
an example of wara, an example of how they were so cautious when it came to what they put inside their stomach, what they consumed. They wanted to make sure as much as possible that it is only halal, halal and halal only. And so on. There are so many other examples from the Sahaba and also from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and later scholars as well. Like there's a famous story of Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. As I'm sure many of you know, Imam Abu Hanifa used to be a cloth merchant. Uh, he, used to, he used to have a business in, in cloth and material. So one day uh, he, um, he, he gave some, uh, <coughs> some um, <coughs> materials and cloth to um, one of his employees. And he said, uh, go to such and such place and you will find a customer waiting for this material. So give him the material and take the money from the customer. But make sure that you point out there's a small defect in this material. So point out the defect to the customer before you, uh, you know, complete the transaction. So the employee takes the material to the customer, uh, has a conversation with the customer, sells the material to the customer, takes the money, comes back to Imam Abu Hanifa at the at the shop and gives him the money. So Imam Abu Hanifa, as he's accepting the uh, the payment for the material, he just wants to confirm. So he asks the employee, "Did you point out the defect to the customer?" And the employee says, oops, sorry, Imam, I forgot. I forgot to point it out. So Imam Abu Hanifa says, here, take the money back and go and go back to the customer and show him the defect. So the employee runs back to, to the customer, but he comes back and he says, yeah, Imam, he's gone. The customer is gone. Imam Abu Hanifa takes that payment and he gives it all in charity, gives the entire payment in charity. This is wara. Why? Because that payment was halal for him. That payment was halal, it was not haram. Why? Because he had sold an item, the person had looked at the item, right? They had, they had the option to look at the item. The customer should have found the defect himself. But he didn't look at it carefully and he gave the payment to, to the seller. Now, this is halal income for the, for, the, for the seller. But Imam Abu Hanifa knows, he realizes that the customer didn't pay attention to the defect. So now, if the customer had known the defect, who knows? Maybe they wouldn't have accepted the material at all. And if that's the case, then that means that when they discover that defect, they're going to feel bad that they paid so much money for a defective item. And whenever you have a commercial transaction where one side feels bad, they feel like they've been shortchanged, then, then um, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. And really, you know, the transaction should be redone if possible because in trade transactions, it is important to have taradi. Taradi meaning that both sides are happy. Both sides feel like they got a good deal. Okay. So because of that, Imam Abu Hanifa gave the entire wealth away in charity. So this is an example of wara as well. Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala, the, the author of the book that we're going through, he's also very well known for living a life of wara. Okay. So... Uh, Imam al nawawi as a faqih, there are many things that, you know, when people ask him, is it halal? He tells them, yes, it's halal. He tells them, yes, it's halal. But when it comes to his own personal life, he doesn't do it. And this is the way of the righteous scholars of Islam. That when it comes to giving fatwa for people, they try to make things easy for people. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. The Prophet ﷺ said, make things easy for people. Don't make things difficult for people. So when it comes to giving fatwa for people, the alim, the true alim, will find a way out for the mustafti. And if, if something is not clearly haram, if there's a way to make it halal, they will say that, inshallah, this is permissible, it's halal. But when it comes to their own personal practice, they are strict, they are precautious. 
and they will avoid it if it is not 100% halal. And that was the case with Imam Nawawi as well. So it's well known about him that Imam Nawawi, when he lived in Damascus, he would not eat the produce of Damascus. Anything grown in Damascus, any fruit grown in Damascus, he would not eat it. He would only eat the fruits and produce that were coming from outside of Damascus, from the countryside. Why? Because he knew that there are many farmlands in Damascus that, you know, a long time ago uh, were confiscated. They were waqf, they were, uh, you know, public property, and they were unrightfully taken by, you know, people who were, who were oppressors. And today, those farms are mixed. Now, nobody knows which farm is you know, historically was confiscated from, from others and which farm was not. It's all mixed up now. So when that is the case, the ruling is, it is permissible for people to eat in that case because it's all mixed up. Remember what I told you about mixed wealth earlier. But Imam al nawi wanted to exercise precaution for himself. And so he would not eat fruits that were grown in the city of Damascus. This is also an example of wara, wara. <clears throat> <clears throat> so essentially, there are two legal axioms that are drawn from this text of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One uh, um, axiom is al khuruj min al khilaf mustahab. Khuruj min al khilaf mustahab. When there is a difference of opinion about something, it is better to get out of that difference of opinion. Meaning that if there is something on which there is a debate. It's better not to engage in that, better not to indulge in that. That's recommended. It's not required, but it's recommended. It's a very useful, very important qaida, fiqhiyya, legal axiom for us to apply and follow in our lives. Al khuruj min al khilaf mustahab. So, for example, if, if there's something, does it break the fast? Does it not break the fast? There's a difference of opinion among the ulama. It's better not to do it. Khuruj min al khilaf mustahab. It's better not to do it because there's a difference of opinion. Okay. The other axiom, though, is al aslu fil ashiyai al ibaha. Al aslu fil ashiyai al ibaha. The default matter in all things is permissibility. Okay. So things may be doubtful, but they are not clearly haram until and unless there is clear proof that it is haram. Now, the last part of the hadith, and I just have about 10 minutes left. The last part of the hadith says, That indeed in the body there is a piece of flesh. If it is sound, if it is rectified, then the rest of the body will be sound and rectified. But if it is corrupted, then the rest of the body will be corrupted. And that piece of flesh is the heart. Um, this part of the hadith is talking about the importance of the heart. Uh, this faculty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the human being, uh, which is the seat of iman, which is the seat of taqwa, which is the seat of faith and piety. The significance of the heart is expressed in this hadith that the heart, as Imam al-Ghazali says, is like a king, and the rest of the body are the subjects of the king. The body responds according to the condition of the heart. If the heart is sound, then the rest of the body will be sound. If the heart is corrupt, then the rest of the body will be corrupt. Meaning what? That if the heart, the condition of the heart is sound, then the behavior of the person will be in conformity with the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the person will be striving outwardly to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The body parts will be moving in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if the heart is corrupt, then the body will be behaving in a way that earns the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this hadith, 
<clears throat> this part of the hadith underscores the significance of the heart in the Islamic tradition. And uh, there are many texts that, that, uh, that speak about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that on the day of judgment, no wealth nor children will bring any benefit except the one who brings to Allah a sound heart, a sound qalb salim. <clears throat> but what does this have to do with the rest of the hadith? And we'll close with this, inshallah. <clears throat> or maybe one more thing and then we'll close, inshallah. What does this uh, have to do with the rest of the hadith? Well, two things. You see, when the heart is sound, wara becomes easier. When the heart is sound, to exercise wara, to exercise precaution in deen becomes easier. But when the heart is not sound, when the heart is corrupted, anytime you see that there's a doubtful matter, you want to indulge in it. Uh, some scholars said it's halal, right? Aren't there scholars that said it's halal? So it's okay for me to do it. Well, that's a, that's a sign of a heart that is sick. That's a sign of a heart that is sick, that always wants to indulge in things that are doubtful. Always looking for the easy way out. Okay, but when the heart is sound, then you begin to live the life of the Sahaba and of the Anbiya where you are precautious. You're precautious in everything. Okay, so... So when the heart is sound, wara becomes easier. They're connected. And also, when the heart is sound, um, when the heart is sound, uh, ikhlas becomes easier. It becomes easier to, to be sincere in one's life, in one's worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> also, the, the inverse relationship is also there, that the more that we avoid doubtful matters, the more it helps us achieve a sound heart. The more that we avoid doubtful matters, the more it protects the heart from becoming corrupted. Okay, so uh, that's also another connection between the first part of the hadith and the second part of the hadith. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Inshallah, um, looks, uh, this hadith uh, was related by Bukhari and Muslim. Inshallah, we have about five minutes left. So I'm not going to go on to the next hadith. We'll, we'll do that tomorrow, inshallah. Um, but uh, if there's any questions, we can, we can take them now, inshallah. We have a few minutes. If anybody has any questions on Facebook or, uh, or uh, YouTube, just feel free to write them in the comment section. <clears throat> By the way, uh, purifying the heart, purification of the heart, uh, that's a discipline of its own, as you know. The discipline of tasawwuf or the discipline of tazkiyah is an entire discipline that completely revolves around how to purify the heart, how to attain a sound heart. And inshallah, uh, you know, on other occasions, we can, we can uh, talk about that because that's a detailed discourse. Many books have been written on it. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf called Purification of the Heart. So uh, you can take a look at that. There's other books as well. Allahu Alam. Any questions from uh, people watching on YouTube or Facebook? <clears throat> If not, then uh, I'll just close by reminding myself and you of a very famous quote of Ibrahim al-Khawas, rahimahullah ta'ala, <clears throat> who is uh, one of the uh, famous scholars and uh, worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the uh, second or third generation of Muslims. Um, he said that uh, the cure for the heart is found in five things. The cure for the heart is found in five things. If you want to attain a qalb salim, if you want to attain a sound heart, do these five things as regularly as possible. Number one, tadabburul Qur'an. Reading the Qur'an with a reflective attitude. Reflecting and pondering over the lessons of the Qur'an. That's number one. Number two, 
maintaining an empty stomach, maintaining an empty stomach, fasting very frequently and eating very little in suhoor and iftar time. Okay, so maintaining an empty stomach, that's number two. Number three, qiyamul layl, qiyamul layl, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night time, night vigils. Number four, at-tadarru'u in the sahar, imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at sahar time. And sahar time is the pre-dawn time, pre-dawn. When we do our suhoor, we sahar suhoor from the same root. Uh, basically, uh, you know, half an hour to an hour before fajr time, that's sahar time. Um, imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during that time. Okay. And uh, the fifth one is mujalasatul salihin to uh, maintain the company of the righteous, maintaining the company of righteous people. So these are five things that he said, rahimahullah ta'ala, bring cure to the ailing heart, to the diseased heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. <clears throat> <clears throat> So there is a question on uh, YouTube, uh, I'm sorry, on Facebook Live that says, um, one time I participated in an office football pool and I own $500. I think he's trying to say I won $500. I don't know what a football pool is. Office football pool. I'm sorry, I don't know what a football pool is, but I'm assuming that this is some kind of a uh, unlawful type of um, money making thing. So then he says, I donated all the money and never participated in any afterwards. Is there anything else I should have done? Uh, if it was a, a haram type of transaction, then you should repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's good that you donated all the money and never participate in it afterwards. That's all you need to do. You don't need to do anything beyond that. You repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you give all the money away in charity, and that's all you need to do. I see, it's a form of gambling. Okay, yeah, so so um, that's exactly what you do. You repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and uh, you make a firm resolve never to do it again, and you give away all of that in charity, okay? That's exactly what you should have done. And that's all that's required from you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all for the, uh, our shortcomings and our lapses in the past and keep us firm on faith. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullahu khairan. Uh, we'll close the session for today and uh, inshallah we'll continue tomorrow. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. وصل اللهم وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق معلن الحق بالحق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم